Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, and I'm delighted to have back the third time now on this channel, Professor Tim Spector, famous as a co-founder of the Zoe Symptom Study, which we've all been faithfully filling in for the last, getting on for a couple of years now, Tim, I guess, is it? Yeah, no, it would be two years in, uh, in uh, three weeks' time. Mm. And of course, you're, you're a professor at King's College London epidemiologist started twin studies and we could go on for, for a long time also a physician of course um so um we've got a bit of a commercial break in a minute tim where we're going to be advertising the, the new citizen science project which you've got me really interested in already but first of all um you've collected empirical data on this idea of the metallic taste now my initial thinking was if you got a metallic taste straight away this could indicate inadvertent intravascular administration but you've collected a lot of data which is very reassuring and it's hard data so what have you found tim please yeah well it's really you know listening to your podcasts uh, realizing that there was this whole new area of metallic taste which most certainly doctors aren't really aware of uh, or most medical professionals before you got to it um uh, this this phenomenon and obviously i think it raised a lot of concern in, in people uh, that, oh gosh, you know, I had my vaccine, I've got a metallic taste in my mouth. Does that mean, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, drop dead of a stroke or, or something else like that, uh, worrying, should I see someone? And so because there's so little written on it, um, you know, after our chat, we decided to go and add it to the, the Zoe uh, COVID symptom list in a way discreetly so people wouldn't uh, be flagged out as saying okay this is because john campbell's told us all about it and you know i'm sure you know I, and bias it so we we put it in fairly discreetly in that in that big list of symptoms that we've been people have been reporting on about vaccines and uh really started tracing that from about november uh when people were getting their either second jabs or their boosters most of them were actually boosters and then we started wanted to link whether those uh, reports, a how common were they, and uh, was there anything special about the people that had them that put them at extra risk, or you know was there anything to say, gosh, you know fifty percent of people with this go on and have uh, blood clots mm -hmm. or myocarditis yeah. or, or or some big immune reaction? Mm -hmm. So that it was really the first time anyone's really done a sort of population study of this. So that's what we did and. Um, we, uh, from our, our base of several um, hundred thousand people that in that time frame that both reported uh, some symptom and had a booster, we got about eighty. Uh, I think it, we had about eighty thousand uh, individuals that satisfied all, all those criteria, and we found that around three percent of them. Uh, did report metallic taste. So this is the first time we've got a, an indication of how common that is mm -hmm. after injection, metallic taste. Now, we asked them, uh, that could have been any time in the, in the, in the week following uh, that injection. And when we narrowed it down to uh, within the first 24 hours, it was uh, around 1% of people. So it's, it's still one in 100 people, so it, it's not that rare. Uh, we weren't able to get it down to within an hour or anything else, but we have to assume that a number of those would be uh, immediate. Uh, it would take another study to work that out. Sure. And then we thought, well, what is it about those those people? So, uh, we, interesting, we, no no big differences between Moderna and Pfizer uh, in terms of uh, likelihood of metallic taste. Uh, there was about a double the risk if uh, in females. So females reported both uh, metallic taste uh, nearly twice as often as males. Um, no big age differences, interestingly. Um, and uh, we also looked at a bleeding at the site of uh, of injury, which is again reported similar sort of numbers, because I think there was we'd had some discussion. That could be a factor just to look at, see if there's anything interesting. There. Then we, so we got all these. So we're talking, uh, I haven't got the exact figures and maybe you might be able to sh share some of the slides later, but sure, sure. Um, how many thousand people, but certainly it's a very big, big sample of people. And we looked, uh, you know, several thousand that had metallic taste within the first uh, 24 hours. And we used in a way as a control group, those are metallic taste later. 
because we think yeah. it would be uh, a different mechanism. Mm. And therefore, all kinds of reasons people get botanic taste, but in a way to reduce the biases, we had sort of several thousand early, several thousand late. We thought that was a good way of looking at it. And then just to see what was there a difference in their reactions. And um, we did find a, a slight correlation between people reporting bleeding and um, uh, metallic taste, um, but there was no increase in severe immune reactions in the early metallic tasters versus the late metallic tasters. So it, it meant that because if we, and we define uh, severe reactions as people having five or more uh, systemic uh, reactions. So this is people, things like fever, headaches, um, shivering, uh, rashes, this kind of stuff that we, we, we've, we've all seen people get those, those reactions. Uh, and if, if a substantial number of those metallic tastes um, in a way uh, were early on, and as we believe giving an extra dose, you, you might've expected that that would have um, really pushed those numbers up. So no difference between our sort of control groups in terms of, of that. There was a slight increase in um, in uh, chance of having a systemic effect at all, but it was no more than if you'd had uh, reported just having a painful arm. Mm, right. So it was sort of you know it was there, but it wasn't sort of a massive uh, difference to you know we, after a Pfizer, a lot of people got a sore arm. Anyway, it wasn't physical; it was actually a local immune reaction. It sort of showed that the, the vaccine had worked. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was it was a good sign, really. Um, uh, and uh, so that that was reassuring. And then we did uh, we compared to all the other side effects and um, uh, did a, a sort of cross correlation. Was metallic taste? You know, how did it compare with anything else? And really, nothing else um, really stood out. Uh, in that way. So I think in conclusion, what we found is that metallic taste is actually quite common. Um, less than 1% of people have it early on. Uh, we don't know exactly where that is. So you know, that's less than one in 100. Maybe of those, you know, it's less than one in two, one in 200 have it within the first hour. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I think we're not ruling out that this is associated rarely with some of these consequences that you uh, and others have postulated. But I think we're saying that most people who get metallic taste in the mouth are not at uh, high risk of side effects. And I think that that's hopefully the reassuring message for the people listening that might have said, oh, gosh, you know, uh, John Campbell said, you know, watch out for metallic side effects. And I know and I'm still waiting for something horrible to happen. Uh, the chances are it's not going to happen. Uh, and you know, it does seem to be a, a quite a common occurrence in, in people having injections. But again, I don't think it necessarily means, you know, we, we should change any of the advice that you've been giving and that, you know, our, our advice on aspiration, but hopefully just puts it in a bit of context. Sure, sure. So, so the, the people that would have the immediate taste in the mouth, which could be potentially caused by inadvertent intravascular administration, were a subset of the early group. And uh, I think it's very clever the way you compared both, such as the power of numbers and statistics and, and large data sets. It's, uh, so if, I, if I've caused anyone undue anxiety with that, I, I unconditionally apologise about that. But it was interesting. But it, it, on the same tack about inadvertent intravascular administration, of course, Germany now is recommending aspiration. So it's, it's uh, m m more to come on that. But certainly I'm reassured by Tim's data and apologies if I've uh, ha have caused anyone any anxiety on that. So thank you for doing that, Tim. And of course, you did tell me about this ahead of time. So we had to keep quite an effort to keep quiet about that for six weeks. But I'm, I'm proud to say I managed it. You know? Yeah, and it, it just shows the power also of citizen science that, you know, you've, Absolutely. You've, got, you've got tools like this. You can answer these questions that would normally take years. Mm -hmm. And uh you, know, you have to write lots of grants and other things to to find out. So I think this is what yeah. what's really exciting about this way of doing yeah. uh, science. Just before we come on to the, the this uh, this uh, interesting new opportunity for citizen science, shall we say, case numbers are actually still pretty high, Tim, on your data, really, aren't they, in terms of symptomatic infections? 
And yet hospitalizations are still going down gradually. Intensive care admissions are going down gradually. Deaths are starting to go down slowly. Is, is this the move into endemicity now? Is, is this becoming predictable? Um, it's starting to look that way, although many people still think that, you know, we'll drop our levels and, and, and we've, we've seen our, our, the reduction stop uh, starting to slow down. So we're not expecting it to suddenly halve next week. I think it's, it looks like it's flattening out at this sort of one in 30 people. Uh, which is still a hell of a lot. Very high. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and we're getting the same sort of results as the, uh, you know, the much more uh, uh, well-known ONS study um, that's been in the news for its its finances. So we, we believe we're real, and this is five times what the confirmed rates are um, mm. in the country. And the confirmed rates of the government are showing reductions. So, you know, the government is saying everything's fine, it's all going away, you know, forget about it but the, the two surveys are definitely not showing that and um, our data which is always a bit ahead of the ONS is showing this is slowing down and it's probably going to stay fairly stable and we are reassured by the hospitals and the uh, and the death rates which well, we're agreeing with are, are definitely reduced but I think big question in everyone's minds is what about long COVID uh, you know what are the consequences that Maybe this subclinical thing. I, know I got Omicron a few weeks ago, and by chance I was having another operation in the hospital on my knee, and they looked at my blood, uh, you know, my uh, blood gases, and so, um, you know, I was at ninety-one percent, and uh, this is three weeks after I had Omicron. I didn't have any real chest symptoms. So, how many people have got some minor problem that's going to linger on? I think we're, we 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 run the risk of sweeping this under the carpet and, mm. and, and uh, just saying, oh, it's all about, uh, you know, ICUs and hospitals. But I think with one in, th you know, if we continue to have one in 30 people all the time uh, with this, a percentage of those are gonna have problems. And I, I just mm. don't, it's unwise to suddenly think we've won. Yeah, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good point. The, the thing that concerns me is there could be some long-term long COVID if it's actually caused by tissue damage. So if there's damage to the myocardium or the pericardium or the the lung parenchyma, that could that could be kind of like a long term potential um deleterious effect, which which is a is a concern. But but given that basically everyone now and how are you now, Tim? Are you are you, are you feel okay now from from your because of course you, you had that you had the Wuhan strain or the original strain back in right. yes, that's right. Um yeah. I've I've had nearly all the strains now, so that's um, uh, they're completely different. So uh, I yeah, two years ago I had the Wuhan strain, and it was all in the chest, and uh, you know lots of fatigue, lots of shorts of breath, nothing up here. This time it was all hitting the nasal mucosa, the sinuses. Uh, that sort of cleared up, but I was left still with a lot of uh, fatigue and uh you know was still unwell for about 10 days so very different but in the end you know both took me out for for, for a couple of weeks interestingly and, but, and so you'd had the infection and presumably you'd had three vaccines as well yes and i think we've got some data showing that really even the, the booster doesn't really stop you getting uh this at all it yeah, just stops yeah. you going to hospital and i yeah. think uh we're, you know but who knows what the next variant will bring you know hopefully the, the boosters will uh stop you getting that but this, this whole theory about how the immune system uh in the nose the mucosal uh, compartment yeah. you know different antibodies that the vaccine doesn't protect you against the sneaky virus gets in there and and targets those bits in the nose and the throat that's why sore throat is such a common symptom now yes. uh, on the Zoe app that, you know, uh, which wasn't at all before. And so uh, it's yes. uh, it's moving around, trying to find a way through our defences. Yes. And I think yeah. that's really interesting. For, it is. So yeah. you've had systemic infection. So presumably you've got systemic memory B and T cells. And now you've had mucosal compartment infection as well, which has probably stimulated long lived uh, immune cells in the mucosal compartment, we would hope. I mean, do you think you've had a fair immune stimulus from your Omicron uh, experience? Blood, 
Bloody hope so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like a, <laughs> don't I, don't, anymore, yeah. I don't fancy this every four months. No, I no. mean, you know, it's, no. uh, uh, but uh, we'll wait and see. You know, this is uh, a, a sneaky adversary and, uh, you know, we, we, we underestimate it at our peril. Really. In, 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 indeed. Yeah, th th thanks for that, Tim. So let's go on now and talk about life after COVID, your new project. Now, I, I don't want to make people jealous, but I think I'm being prioritised for a kit that we can, we can demonstrate. So, so t t tell us what th th this is a really good opportunity for citizen science collecting data in the way that you have done um, through the pandemic. And we want to carry this on. What, 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 how can people get involved in this, Tim? Well, there's sort of two projects which um, we've we've been talking about, John. So. Um, one is uh, that, you know, we want people to continue uh, logging on to the Zoe COVID app because we are not just doing COVID now, but we're broadening it to uh, use that amazing mm. uh, teamwork we've, we've done together to combat dementia, cancer, heart disease, uh, mental health issues, uh, and musculoskeletal. And we think we can do this in just the same way that we've been doing uh, with COVID in a totally innovative way. And that's totally uh, free to subscribe. And we're, we're getting people now to log in and fill in real more, more detailed health questionnaires uh, and getting another snapshot of lifestyle, things like your diet and uh, your snacking habits and uh, other, other little things like this. So really do, uh, do go back if you've come off the app uh, and look at these other features because I think uh, this is going to be valuable to the individual as well as uh, the whole science community and uh, we want to keep that going uh, really important and the other project uh, is that we're announcing today to uh, our the people who are already on the Zoe wait list who've gone to the joinzoe.com uh, website that uh, we're finally, after years and years uh, of research and, and a lot of time because of COVID, bringing the Zoe nutritional uh, product to the UK. And so it's already in the US and people can uh, purchase it in the US. And this just is a way of personalizing uh, your uh, foods for your body. And we do that with a glucose monitor, a, a blood fat test, looking at inflammation and your triglycerides and a microbiome test. And we put all that together and give you a, a really a personalized coaching plan with uh, basing an online uh, nutritional coach to try and achieve your, your, your various goals. And so that's, uh, that's very exciting because we've got a lot, of, a lot of people waiting for this in the UK because uh, I've been talking about it a lot and uh, finally <laughs> relieved I, I can actually deliver. So they're the, they're the two things. Um, and uh, we'd love people to, to really uh, do both um, and uh, both feed into our research because everyone who signs up for either of them is consenting to, to share their data with everyone else. So and, we and learn the, more, the, the more about the microbes, mice, presumably. Yes, of yeah. course, all the data is, is yeah. very safe. It's not given to third parties, it's anonymized, but it is incredibly useful because it's the power of big data that allows us to personalize it for the individual and particularly as we're now working out all the the subtleties of the gut microbiome all that you know what those microbes are doing which disease they're linked to and you know uh, which foods you can eat or to cut out to improve them or not and that that's incredibly exciting area where you know instead of just relying on medicines we can start to rely on um targeted foods for our gut microbes and, and modify our immune system that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I talked about last time about how important our, our gut microbes are for, you know, in preventing against COVID. And, mm -hmm. but that's just as an example of how it can help in, in all, all kinds of chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. So the, the app's going to be available to our friends in the, in the States and Canada and all over the world. Is it Tim? Is that, is that the plan? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, it, it, so um, the, um, the, no, the wider health study is currently just in the in the UK at the moment. Right, but but the, the app is anywhere. But it? the but the, the personalized nutrition side of it is available in the US and shortly in the UK. Got it. 
Got it. So this is what I haven't understood until actually I started reading your books that, for example, when when tell us what happens when you eat bread versus when you eat pasta, Tim. That's a great example. Um, yes. So I thought eating brown bread was really good for you, you know, of course. Hovis, etc. You know, uh, <laughs> we were brought up on this. But it turns out it's been the worst possible thing for, for me because it gave me a, an enormous sugar peak. And that meant that there's more inflammation in the body and that uh, I was hungrier three hours later than I would normally be. So I'd probably over the course of the next 24 hours eat more and it was bad for my metabolism. And so that would then have an effect on my gut microbes, et cetera. So whereas my wife, who I also tested, uh, I really um, annoyingly could eat as much bread as she liked and never got a sugar peak. And so personalizing foods in this way allows you to tailor, you know, what is the best breakfast? So I no longer have porridge oats or uh, carbs or, you know, muesli or bread. I have yogurts and uh, nuts and seeds or a boiled egg. Yeah. And I find that suits my metabolism much better. It means I, you know, I'm not as hungry three hours later, don't have any big sugar dips and, without allows you to help your weight without thinking at all about calories and i think that's that's the magic of this and it's you know and you know yeah. the whole thing is how we can individualize everything and, and bring a holistic approach to how we eat so it's not just what you eat it's how you eat how you sleep the night before whether you exercise or you're a morning person evening person all this kind of stuff so it's it's a sort of equivalent research project and we've now We've done about 15,000 people, I think, so far in the US. So we have this huge database that's accumulating, yeah. uh, linking diets, foods, microbes, uh, and all these sugar responses. So, yeah, I think in a way it's an extension of this whole concept of people doing experiments on themselves uh, to learn more without having to rely on, you know, uh, governments or agencies to tell them what to do or eat, because there's absolutely no one size fits all. We all yeah. totally unique in our terms of our gut microbes uh, absolutely fascinating you, you can't say there's good and bad foods we can only say there's good and bad foods for a particular individual so i love this idea because we can collect huge amounts of data and i can learn personally how to optimize my my uh my, my nutrition the things that are actually best for me as an individual so it really is a win-win uh, situation isn't it i think so and i think we're we're seeing this huge trend you know, the huge trend in restricted time eating or intermittent fasting mm, mm. that's been driven from the US, I yeah. think, but is, is coming to you know other countries pretty quickly is, is really a reaction to, to that people want to control things themselves. They don't want to be uh, beholden to some diet company or a food manufacturer or have a restrictive diet yeah. uh, or have a diet sheet given them to, from the NHS that's yeah. inappropriate. I think people really like the idea that they can do this themselves it's empowering and i think that's mm. that's all part of this idea and in a way you know the covid app is also another sign of you know not want you know trusting the data that you produce or we produce together rather than relying on some, mm. totally on someone else to to do it for us and deliver it so i think it's very much a new era in healthcare that mm. all of us want to take more control and and, and learn how to do it and i think you know, whether it's, and these apps are just the ideal way to, I think, to have this information two ways. Um, and, and, and so versatile, as we've seen with, you know, metallic taste and who would have yeah, thought yeah, yeah. Would, have, would have done it, you know, you say something and then a few weeks later. You, you actually know, crunch out an answer. <laughs> on a court, you know, and with a quarter of a million people. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Database. So um, last question, Tim. Um, we know that an optimized microbiome can be achieved by a large diversity, particularly of plant-based foods, although not exclusively, but largely plant-based foods. That'll optimize my immune system. What else will an optimized microbiome do for my health and longevity? And why should I bother? Um, we think it's pretty much related to everything that <laughs> relates to your immune system. Yeah. Um, so it's a key regulator of the immune system. And if you think of it in that way, uh, you know, suddenly we've discovered a way that we can modulate our immune system without drugs. Mm. And just by getting greater diversity, changing the ratio of the good to bad microbes, mm. which means that 
uh, you should be able to reduce overreaction of the immune system with allergies, uh, potentially reduce autoimmune diseases. Um, the immune system plays a role in cancer mm -hmm. in terms of immune surveillance, picking up those micro tumors. Mm -hmm. And so which we're getting every day, but mm -hmm. our immune system uh, behind the scenes, you know, does an amazing job of, of killing them early. So we're, we're helping them, those guys. And of course, mopping up all the problems of uh, age-related oxidation and damaged cells. Again, our immune system is key. So more and more, I think we've, we're changing our idea that um, you know, the axis is not just based on our genes or um, one or two magic ingredients. It's, it's this complex network of the microbiome and the immune system working together to keep us in, in this sort of balance. And the, and the better the state of our microbes, the better the state of our immune system. And, you know, and it, and I say it also affects things like mood because mm. Mm. The microbes are actually really chemical factories that produce vitamins and, and uh, hormones yeah. and, and everything to regulate our brain and keep us happy. So I could keep going, I could go on all day about uh, enthusing about the gut microbiome, but I think we're just at the beginning of our knowledge. Yeah, That's no, the other thing here. And, fascinating. you know, you know, we, we find out these microbes do things we never, we never dreamt of uh, before. And I've got a fighting um, chance of dropping five kilos as well, hopefully. Oh yes, exactly. Just yeah. get, you know, it's going to help your microbes do it. And if yeah. you can blame them, if they don't, they don't get it right. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to my kit and I will be showing it off as soon as it arrives, Tim. So, uh, so yeah. Professor Tim Spector, um, founder of many things, physician, twin study expert, epidemiologist, we could go on. Thank you very much for coming on. And uh, we'll put all the links, of course, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep us informed whenever you'd like to drop back on. Of course, you're always welcome. It's a, a pleasure working with you, John. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tim.